Okay, I'm live. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sunny Handel. I am a journalist, writer, and social media editor at Open Democracy. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is Open Democracy's weekly live discussion where we try and tackle a, a big topic um, that is in the current affairs. And today we're going to be looking at why ethnic minorities, especially in Britain, are hesitant or seen as more hesitant to take the COVID vaccine. What does that say about the NHS? Um, what are people finding in terms of journalists as well as doctors and how we can tackle that? Um, we want this conversation to involve you as much as possible. I, I, thank, I want to thank everyone who submitted their questions in advance and I'm going to try and get to that as well as questions in the chat. So we're going to try and keep this a rolling discussion um, so that it's interactive, dynamic and interesting. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom, please click on chat and the icon at the bottom and then you can uh, post your questions there. Open Democracy is a worldwide uh, news publication. We do uh, comment, we do uh, news reporting, we do investigations and features on topics around the world. We've been going for about 20 years and we're really pleased to have this uh, amazing panel. I'm going to introduce you to, to them in a minute. Joining us are uh, Thuva Amuthan, uh, a former refugee focused on challenges faced by black and minority ethnic communities. He's currently working on tackling vaccine reluctance among ethnic minorities. Also joining us is Oni Okonguo. Um, sorry, I must have butchered that name. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Glad to have you join us again. Um, who is a GP and co-chair of the West Midlands Regional and British Medical Association Black and Minority Ethnic Network. She's involved in reaching out and tackling vaccine hesitancy among ethnic minority patients as well. Um, and Sima Kotecha Dudley is uh, an award-winning BBC journalist who's reported from Italy at the height of the pandemic and also has spent time in Afghanistan and Lebanon. She's frequently reported on vaccine disinformation had hesitancy in the UK. So that's the panel and um, I'd love for your comments as well. So if you have them, like I said, please use the chat. Let's start with you Seema, tell me, what have you found um, in your reporting on this issue? What kind of misinformation or what have people told you so far? Well, good to be here, Sunny. Thank you for inviting me, first of all. Um, I've been covering this topic for about, I don't know, a month or so now. And what I can say is that misinformation is rife. It might be stating the obvious, but there are some people who think that, you know, it's being over-exaggerated. And um, I really believe from, you know, the digging I've done that it's out there and people are actually believing it. We recently made a film um, about inhaling steam. One of the popular misconceptions that's out there at the moment is that if you inhale steam, you protect yourself from catching coronavirus. Now, that is not true, but it is something that is believed in some South Asian communities. And um, having spoken to dozens of people across uh, England, I found that many people actually are inhaling steam with the hope that they won't catch COVID as a result of that. So um, that's one of the myths that we've been trying to debunk at the BBC through doctors and experts. I think it's really um, encouraging to see that people are listening, they're changing their minds. Um, but I think also it's really important to say that the people we are speaking to are not stupid. We're not trying to say that these communities don't have the intellect to understand you know, what is right and what is wrong. That is absolutely not the case. They have valid reasons, whether that's mistrust of the establishment, whether it's racism, whether it's just wanting the vaccine to be around longer to see the impact of it on, on individuals. So I think, you know, we need to just be careful that we don't depict communities as being illiterate by saying that there is this misconception out there and that many people are believing it. That's a really good point. I, I think there has been a lot of uh, um, that as well, people sort of... Uh, painting minority communities as um, being uh, sort of, you know, like you said, illiterate or incompetent or not really knowing what's out there. And I think that's probably just as harmful as well. Uh, Oni, tell, tell us um, about some of the work that you've been doing and what have you found in um, speaking to uh, patients, if you don't mind. Uh, 
Hi, Sonny. Thanks for inviting me. So, um, what have we found in patients? Well, like Sima said, there is a lot of misconception and there is a lot of misinformation. And obviously, I, I don't know, I don't want to say the NHS was a bit slow getting off the mark with getting the information out there. So, first of all, people had all this misinformation from different sites and we are putting the information out there, but uh, sometimes you wonder who it's getting to. So we're using the normal media. So things like Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, but quite a few of my patients don't use any of that because they don't trust them. So they get their news from Unity FM, Bungle TV, uh, BBC Asia Network. So we are getting the information out there, but unfortunately it's not getting to the people sometimes that we want it to get to. So then they have to rely on the misinformation they're getting from their friends on WhatsApp to make their decision. But we are getting there, but it's slow and it's not as, well, I say as quick as I would have wanted it to be. And so what do they tell you? Is it just like the steam stuff or is it uh, more than that? I mean, are they, you know, is it just misinformation? I mean, a lot of people have said it's racism, um, that, you know, there's historical racism uh, even within the NHS. And perhaps that's a reason why um, a lot of people feel like they can't trust what is going on. Do, do you think that's true or not? Unfortunately, I have to say yes. Because um, I don't know if you saw, there was a report that was sent out um, when they did the, um, the research, the Q research that was done last year that spoke to people and asked them what they felt about taking the vaccine even before we started. And a lot of people stated that, especially with the Black Asian minority ethnic population, that part of the reason why they weren't going to take it was because they didn't trust the government and they didn't trust the information that the government was giving them or even institutions like and the NHS, because let's be honest, for a long time, we've been saying this, there's a big health inequality when it comes to healthcare. For once, this whole COVID situation has shone a light on it. Not only are the BAME people disproportionately dying from it, but there are reasons why they've been doing that. And part of it is because of what I would say, health inequality and racism. It's not the same when you go to hospital as a BAME professional or even a BAME patient as there is for other ethnicities. I have friends that have been in hospital as doctors, consultants, and treated less than. I have one that last year I had to go and rescue her from a hospital. She's a consultant, but they were treating her like she was a junkie and she was looking for medication. Obviously, with that kind of attitude, she would not trust the NHS. She works in the NHS, but she had to call me to discuss about the vaccine. So it's been a long history of BAME population not being treated as fairly as they should, that has made them mistrust or distrust the government and the NHS as a whole. So when, now we are coming out to them to say, the vaccine is safe, you can have it. They don't trust the information. So we need to go back to trying to regain that trust and understand how things went wrong, why it went wrong, adjust that, and then we can then say to them, this is safe for you. This is what we are now doing at the moment. So you're saying their own interactions with the NHS in the way that they're being treated by other staff has made a lot of people, especially I think minorities, really distrustful of, I don't know what some doctors might say. And that, as a result of that, they, um, they don't trust the vaccine information. That's exactly what I'm saying. So they don't trust the sources. So they don't trust the government sources. They don't trust the NHS sources. They'd rather hear the message from people that they know and they trust and they believe will tell them the truth because they haven't had the best of experiences. And I have to say, our CCG is trying to do that. So they've created a website that is devoid from government and the NHS trust, just to give people that information. And that is the kind of thing that we need. People need to hear it from people they know and they trust. Duba, you're nodding your head. Have you faced a lot of, uh, have you seen a lot of vaccine hesitancy as well amongst ethnic minorities? Uh, you're uh, muted. 
the statement of the centre, yeah? Um, I think Oli's highlighted quite a lot of the things already, but um, when it really truly sank in was when I was talking to my mum and she was like, oh, what's this? I hear there's a microchip in the vaccine. I was like, really? <laughs> I was like, where did this come from? And I was thinking, you know, this is this is an issue close to home. You know, like, you know, I had to sit down and be like, how is that even possible? That's not something that's possible. But then um, one of my partners today said, if you look at the vaccine and how it was developed, if you look at the centers where the vaccines are trialed and historically where vaccines are developed, these are in ethnic minorities countries. And you can see from there why this hesitancy is there from that. That alone is sufficient. Um, and not something else that struck me and uh, highlighted the racism in the NHS, which is evident, and there's plenty of evidence to say there's the NHS is racist. If anyone questions that, I'm sorry, uh, I can prove, I, I can give you the data to prove that that's the case, um, is when I was a GP training in the pandemic and I was uh, working in a practice and one of the partners um, uh, said while carrying out a risk assessment for me, um, you know, they in communities are more affected, but that's because, you know, there's more unemployment and more, they're very, they're less educated than the rest of us. And I was, I was just got smacked. I was like, did you just say that to me? I was like, unbelievable. And you, you wonder why patients of ethnic minorities are hesitant to rely and trust the advice of healthcare staff, you know, whatever ethnicity they are, even us, you know, even we are having a tough time convincing our own staff, let alone patients of, you know, to have the vaccine because yes, you know, the misinformation about uh, microchips and things, those are easily um, eradicated or uh, alluded to. But, you know, the other concerns about fertility in young women, especially, that's something you know, that's hard to uh, convince someone about when they already have a pre-existing mistrust of the system because of historic bias. We've known all along for years and years that poor access to healthcare for BAME communities, either because of language barriers, career, um, cultural barriers, or, you know, uh, beliefs that are different, um, and that need more time invested in them to give them the same outcomes. Um, but COVID has only made it more apparent, and we're still going around looking for more data. What data are we looking for? The data already exists. Um, you know, it took an emergency motion of the Royal College of General Practitioners to bring in an action plan to try to elude this issue. A man's clinicians in the first place, not alone patients. Like, do we really need to wait for that to happen? Why have we not addressed this earlier? What's been a delay here? And even, even since we've done, a lot of the BAME community and groups have been active on this issue, with you know, numerous webinars, trying to inform other communities. But should it really be left to us to do that job? Where is the NHS in them? Why have they waited so long to do something about it? Even now, if you look at the COVID vaccination data, you can see a mismatch in the population that are vaccinated and not vaccinated. The BAME communities have received less vaccine compared to everyone else. Why is that? And why is it taken this long and this much for the NHS to do something about it? And I'm, I'm still not convinced that we're doing enough. What, a lot of people have also said that there is a big difference between um, different minority communities as well within that BAME, you know, um, label. Now, have you seen that in your own work as well? Is there large differences between, let's say, the biggest groups, Asian and Black communities, uh, people, um, and the NHS? And what does that look like? From a personal experience, I can say that in the South Asian communities, the mis mistrust and the misinformation is rife. The rumours and things, like um, Seema said, they depend on each other for news and information. And those things, you know, they, they spread very quickly and they trust each other more than the news and more than the government literature, more than us. And therefore, it's a battle that we're fighting to try to um, inform otherwise or tell them the actual facts because they're already misinformed and it's hard to break something down when someone is already so invested in an idea. To unpick that is very hard. And Oni, what do you think? Is there a big difference uh, in the way Black and Asian patients are uh, dealing with vaccine hesitancy? Or, or, I mean, is there big differences in terms of, um, I mean, there's been some polls actually showing that <coughs> vaccine hesitancy among um, Black Britons is much higher than um, Asian Britons. Would you agree with that? Or what do you think? Yes, I would agree with that simply because, okay, for uh, as a Black person, we're not just dealing with all the other health inequalities there are, 
We're also dealing with the fear of being experimented on. Historically, Black people have been experimented on. I don't need to start naming Tuskegee, go to um, Susan Moore last year when she died because she was looking for COVID treatment. So there's been historical problems when it comes to experimentation. So saying to a Black person, you need to have this vaccine. Yes, an Asian person might ha not have it or be hesitant to have it because of misinformation. But for us, it goes even beyond the misinformation to experimentation. And if you remember, it wasn't, it was only last year when the French um, doctor was talking about going to do these vaccine trials in Africa. So for yeah. us, there is also that bit of it. So that even makes us, if you look at the figures, actually is the black population that is the least having the vaccine because I have to be honest here and say I was hesitant to start with. I was of the same opinion. I was like, let everybody else have it first. And then if they don't die, then I will go and have it because we have that history behind us. But then I had to go out there and look for the information myself. And I count myself in a privileged position that I have access to this information. There are other people like me who don't. So then have to depend on the history that they know, their health belief, and then the misinformation. So that even makes we the black people what's up. And do you think the government is now, what should the government do? Should it be sort of saying, well, we need to make a renewed effort with uh, Black Britain? I think the government has a lot to do. I think we need to acknowledge the problem. Like Kevin, Professor Kevin Fenton has been saying, look, there are things that need to be put in place to address the health inequalities because we are all just focusing on COVID vaccine and the COVID pandemic. What happens beyond that? These health inequalities are going to still exist. We need to start looking at now, trying to engage with these communities, trying to understand the problems, put things in place, do things with them rather than to them. Don't make decisions for them. Go down to the grassroots and find out the problem and address it. If we do that, then we can regain that trust. But I think the first thing we must have to do is acknowledge there is a problem and what the problem is. Then we can go about fixing it. Seema, you're, you're nodding your head as well. What, what, what do you think? I think absolutely. Yeah, bang on. I think there needs to be an acknowledgement. I think we've got the vaccine minister, obviously, Nadim Zawahi, who's basically trying to, he says, uh, get into these communities. But I, I guess for me, having covered this for so long, um, the government knew there was a problem with getting messages out to certain communities back in April and May. And I guess, you know, being completely honest, I'm, I'm surprised it's taken this long to actually do something about it or to try to do something about it. So um, I'm, I'm, you know, I think many people who, who I've spoken to have said that they're frustrated with it having taken so long. I know that certain politicians did raise it with government in the early days. Um, and I think, yeah, you're, you know, absolutely right. The, the, the level of mistrust is, is, is huge, uh, especially among the black community. I mean, I think South Asians, if they've got a South Asian doctor, and we know there are more South Asian doctors than there are black doctors, um, if they've got a South Asian doctor in their family or they've got a South Asian doctor that they know and they speak to them, then, you know, their concerns uh, are, are kind of answered. But I think for the black community, it's, it is a lot more difficult and the experimentation point is also true the fact that you know uh, uh black people used to experiment on at some point that is still something that people are talking about and that i've heard from people i've spoken to and i'm not this is not a dig at you or the bbc but do you think the media more generally should be asking more questions around why the government isn't um has not got not grappled with this issue fully yet yes and and i i think every opportunity i've had I've, I've definitely kind of tried to find some answers but absolutely I think the more questions we ask the better I think there's also concern and this is a guess I have no insight but I think there's concern of 
depicting particular communities in a certain way in government. I think they're they're very much on edge. Um, I a source in government did tell me a couple of weeks ago, a very senior source, that they are incredibly concerned about this, and you know they're trying to do what they can. Um, but yes, I think I think the more questions we ask, the better, because I don't think this is going anywhere anytime soon. We see in figures every day I and mean, there are more figures today that show you know there is still hesitancy people are reluctant um and you know it's the mum test i mean my mum uh, asks me silly questions on a daily basis i'm very close to my mum i speak to her numerous times a day and she will send me messages or ask me on the phone Seema, is this true Seema, is this true and i'm like no it's not true and you know not everyone has somebody like that who they can actually ask and trust and believe and and i think that's a real problem yeah Duba, in even in terms of um healthcare staff i mean i saw some statistics this week saying that um that even amongst ethnic minority healthcare staff there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy why do you think that is and what's being done about it your mic is muted by the way I think, again, it leads to all the historic stuff. And Can you just come a bit closer to the mic? I can't. I think it's all from the historic stuff. And, you know, what they do, what we've done with COVID and the COVID vaccine, it's never been done before at the scale it's been done before, as quickly it's been done before. So, you know, it is in some ways been, um, we've had to leave, deal with a lot of uncertainty. And as a healthcare professional, it's a balance of risk versus benefit. And obviously what we did was the right thing, you know, with vaccinating really well, 17 million people now, and it's worked out to be safe. And they did have sufficient data to say that it wouldn't cause harm to patients for us to even consider rolling it out. So that's, a, so it's a, it's a delicate situation to begin with when we set out on this process of vaccinating the nation. Now, again, if you consider the fact that the BAME population with COVID pandemic was affected much uh, more than every other population, then you have to think about the hesitancy from anyone and everyone who looks at this vaccine in that they may think that surely this vaccine, if it's going to have a side effect, equally have a detrimental effect to the BAME population. So you can see where their concerns are coming from. But as a healthcare professional myself, having looked at the data, I was satisfactorily happy that it was the safest thing to do and get the vaccination. I would accept the same things as Oni. I wasn't the first and foremost one to volunteer to have the vaccination, but when it was my time, I did have the vaccination. And I think that we had uh, more than enough uh, protection mechanisms and reporting in place to uh, do everything safely. And we did do everything safely. I think that's one of the possible reasons why there is still some hesitancy from healthcare professionals, um, including fellow doctors, believe me or not. Um, I've had GPs who contacted me after my other interviews and said, well, actually, I haven't looked at this data. This is not, you know, you're not so right. And I'm like, mm, okay. Oni, have you faced or dealt with a lot of hesitancy amongst medical staff as well? Of course. And they how are you human. With They're human as well. Don't forget. So, yeah. Each and every one of us, if we are being honest, we have our fears. And I think we need to realize something. It's not for everyone, is it? Vaccine is never going to be for everyone. At the end of the day, our job, and I, I don't want us to, um, because they are trying to get the same information that I have. I have got more because I've been in the position where I could get more. Some of them need that information. It might not come as quickly as they need it to be able to make a choice, but we need to allow them to make that choice. 70 million is a lot. And all those 70 million weren't vaccinated on day one. So as doctors, as healthcare professionals, we want the information because the NHS is all about making an informed choice. So we need to allow people that headspace we need to give them that information and allow them to make an informed choice. But rather than, because what I don't want is a situation whereby people feel they are being put under pressure. We have to be careful about that. So I do see it with a lot of my healthcare professionals. They call me and they say, Oni, you know more about this. You've been to some of the meetings. What do you think about that? And we have a discussion and then they make their decision. So I think we need to allow, understand that 
healthcare professionals are humans. They need the information just like everybody else, and they need the headspace to make the decision. But yes, we still have that hesitancy because they don't have that information. And so I wonder what's the best way to tackle this? I mean, there's issues around misinformation, issues around racism, like how can we convince and uh, convince our communities to, to, you know, take the vaccine and tackle misinformation? Like what, what, what has worked for you and what, what would you suggest other people do? Seema, do you want to start? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, at, at the beginning, everyone was talking about getting community leaders. I hate that phrase. I mean, what does a community leader mean? But community leaders, religious leaders, imams, um, you know, priests in, in temples, gurdwaras. Um, I don't I don't think that's the only way I think I think from my experience I think like I said for my mom I've kind of been her point of call um and my mom's not stupid you know again I I think it's so important to address that these people have valid concerns but she she trusts me and maybe if I wasn't around it would be a different matter I think it's having people you trust um giving you that information whether that's friends relatives also I think um you know, even my coverage, I mean, the BBC, I keep saying this to colleagues, people in my mum's social bubble do not watch the BBC, you know, they watch ZTV, they listen to Sunrise Radio, I think from a media point of view, we need to get the message out on the right platforms, whether it's the Asian network, or whether, like I said, it's Z or, or Sunrise or something like that. And I think it's it's really important that we we try and make that happen. I mean, my mum uh, gets a lot of these messages on WhatsApp. We know that they're rife on WhatsApp. But I also know people in their 80s and, and 90s. I have a friend whose mother's in her late 80s. She's Sikh and her mother gets all her misinformation just from talking to her friends on the phone. So um, she sits at home watching TV. And so we just need to work harder, I think, to get the right messages on the right media platforms so that these people are properly targeted. Um, just know from families and friends, and, and I'm sure you're aware, um, you know, that they don't consume mainstream media. They don't sit there watching the six o'clock or the 10 o'clock news or reading the Times or, you know, the Guardian. They're, they're, they've got their own little media um, bubble. Yeah, absolutely. And you've done some videos in Gujarati as well um, <laughs> to try and uh, encourage more Gujarati people. What, what, did you, what kind of feedback did you get from that? Like, what did people say to you and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, I mean, I I, um, I feel really strongly um, about uh, getting these messages to people who don't speak English. We know from being in these communities and not everyone does speak English. You know, I get criticism saying, oh, they should go home, all of that rubbish that we, we sometimes get on social media if they don't speak English. You know, but the fact of the matter is there are people who don't speak English in this country from particular communities. And they also... Um, deserve to know what's what's true and what's not and so we must work harder to to get these messages out there um and so much work is being done by by famous faces such as Adil Ray and, and Mira Sayal we know that there's this tv uh advert that's going out today just before 10 um but as I said and this is nothing and I've spoken to Adil about this there's nothing critical at all but it is going on mainstream media and it we need to kind of push that sort of rhetoric onto the platforms somehow um, and I don't know how to I've tried but um, you know so that, that, that it's reaching the right people. Yeah absolutely so what, what do you think in terms of um, how do we well, what's worked for you in terms of tackling hesitancy and what, what do you suggest to people how, how do they what should they do and what shouldn't they do? I think what's worked for me is providing that information, like um, Seema said, in a, from, a, from a trust, a person who's trusted, telling you that information um, and the facts to unpick those mistrusts. Yeah, it's what's worked for me in, in, you know, in terms of you know, going through the, I guess, like Ronnie said, our colleagues, we can explain to them in terms of technological advances, you know, this is all technology, this is just the new user, uh, the user tweaking, but that, that kind of works for our own colleagues. But, you know, when it's uh, a lay person, you have to really, Sit them down and explain it to them. And coming from someone who they trust, it, it goes along, it goes much further than it, it would from general media or the NHS. And I think Seema again is correct in that. I think we need to get, get it out to the right platforms and get um, reach that 
uh, reach the BME group that we're not reaching with typical media, and that you know that is partly um, national um, programs and uh, engagement through the national media, or um, you know the BME is typical ZTV, Asian channels, and all the radios and everything like that. And I guess the other thing is um, putting out the explaining videos on YouTube and social media for the younger population to share out and get it onto propagate onto social media because. Um, the way my mom gets the news is WhatsApp as well. So that's the problem. It's all in WhatsApp. Maybe they should be doing more to clamp down on fake news like Facebook and things. They should do more to help that uh, the VME groups as well. Because again, I guess um, AI and the software platforms are designed better and are more adapted to the English fake news. And maybe that technology has to expand to cover other languages and other communities rather than just the English communities. Maybe they should do it more because that's where the problem is. The bad news and the fake news is coming from social media, which is still getting faster. Um, and so that's what we need to look at. Um, and these are all things that should both be, I guess, governmentally led uh, or NHS led. And because the staff on the front line are doing their bit, you know, I get notifications every day about COVID webinars. Someone's doing a COVID webinar every day targeting our own niche BME communities and you know I get different videos every day about different people doing it in different languages so us on the ground are doing as much as we can the only thing that's missing is top down so you think government action is missing the most here yeah. in terms of only what, what do you think do you what works for you in terms of trying to speak to someone who's hesitant about the vaccine and what messages work, what don't, and where, where do you where do you think most work needs to be done? Okay, so um, in Birmingham and Solihull, I have to say we've done a lot. We've started, like I said at the beginning, what we did was the, um, the BAME community or the clinical leads that um, need the uh, BAME staff network, we took away that research and we looked at it and we came out with an action plan which we sent to the CCG and said, these are the reasons why this is happening. This is what we think you need to put in place for us to be able to try to overcome this. And I have to agree with Tuba. I was having exactly the same conversation with Dr. Varney, who is our public health director for Birmingham and Solihull about this same thing this afternoon, where I was saying to him, do you realize that we had more um, adverts and messages about wear your face mask, distance yourself and all that, than we have about the vaccine. It's almost like it's not happening. I have, because I've, as part of the action plan, we've had to go down to the grassroots. So I had a project where I had to go to all the GPs in a particular area where the uptake wasn't as good as it should be. And it was mostly BIM communities to ask them, what is going on? What are you doing? Is it working? If it's not, what can we do to support you and support your patients? And one of the things I kept hearing over and over again was, it's almost as if there is nothing going on. There is no presence. People, even with the flu campaign, we would put banners in GP surgeries to say, get your flu vaccination here. But there is nothing, there's absolutely no presence. So mm. it's a bit um, disconcerting that we're having this huge vaccination program that is everywhere, but there is nothing on it. But we've, we've started doing a lot of um, local initiatives. So like I said, we've gone to the grassroots GPs to find out what the problem is, and we've started putting things in place, be it um, we have now mobile vans, which are like vaccination vans, because one of the things people said is access. Some people cannot get to the mass site. Some people cannot get to the GP hubs. So we now have four mobile vans that will go out to churches, to mosques, to temples to say to them, do you want us to help vaccinate your over 65s? Get them together, give us a date, we'll come and do that. Mm -hmm. We started doing the vaccine um, information in various languages. We've done Tamil, we've done um, Punjabi, we've done Somalian, because these are our local languages in Birmingham. Because it broke my heart about three weeks ago when one of my patients came, he had a fever and he did not understand why he couldn't go to his GP to get help when he had the fever. 
we've been saying for almost a year now, you should not go to the GP when you have a fever. But because he wasn't English, wasn't his first language, he doesn't read English, he doesn't watch English channels, he didn't understand that. So it really broke my heart having to say to him, you've got to leave the surgery now and I will call you and get you some help. So this is one year on. So that's why we've taken the initiative to make sure that we get the, in, the vaccine information translated in all the languages that we know that we have in Birmingham. And also as part of all, all the things we're doing, we, we're trying really to get this information to as many people as possible. We're talking with people like Bungle TV, we're talking with some of the black newspapers to say, can we put an advert? Because people want this information, but where, are, where is it? We are putting it, like I said, in mainstream media, but it's not getting to the people. But most importantly, we're doing things like this having an honest conversation. Let people come on, talk to them, answer their questions honestly, rather than shine behind and saying, oh, go here and get the information. The council is having all these drop-in sessions, which is open for all the Birmingham residents. And they have one that is done with the mayor and faith leaders. So whichever way you want to get the information, you can go on to these seminars and ask your questions. We need to provide safe environments for people to be able to air their views and be able to un un get their questions answered rather than saying to them, go here to get it or go there to get it. And you have to... Oh, I think we lost Oni there for a minute. Um, hopefully we'll come back to her um, when she gets her connection back. Tuva, I want you to ask you this question. Oni mentioned the fact that, you know, there's not enough discussion about vaccines uh, in terms of minority communities tackling, uh, you know, in terms of... Um, actually, Oni, are you back? Can you hear, can yes, you hear me? Am. Okay, sorry, good, sorry. Um, you mentioned that, you know, there's not enough information about these vaccines going out to the communities. That seems to be the biggest issue. But you also mentioned something else that a lot of people have raised with me, which is access, which is the mobile vans and stuff like that. Is that a big problem? But I mean, questions for both of you. Yes. Is access to vaccination centers a big problem in our, in our community, in the minority communities? In some places, yes. And it's not just a question of distance. It's also a question of work patterns, so some people do, if you remember, a lot of BIM population do jobs that are not kind of executive roles, nine to five roles. Like when you talk about frontline staff, a lot of them are BIM staff. And when you talk about other jobs that are people facing like taxi drivers and they are quite a lot of them are BIM. So they don't work the usual nine to five hours. So mm. then putting on clinics and places or putting the, like in general practice, we don't have it in every GP surgery. We have it in hubs. So in some cases, because you have these GP groups where you go and have it, some of those hubs are not very close to where the patients live. And that then means that they struggle to get there. And sometimes it's also the timing. We do eight to eight, but we know some of them finish work about 10. So and then sometimes it, it's just not convenient for them. And that's why we're saying, that's why we came up with that van option, as well as the mass vaccination site to say, look, this is the van. Tell us a date when you have time or you feel that you want to have it. And we will come there and vaccinate you. That way we take away that distance and we take away that um, time problem. Right. And Tuva, what do you think? Do you think access is a big problem. Do a lot of people say to you that they can't access um, the vaccinations sites? Definitely. I think access is a fundamental problem, and I think the system is flawed from the day out, if you want to look at it in every way possible that Tony's picked out. Um, from, from as little as, you know, how day-to-day -day GP services work, like Oni said, um, patients of BAE communities don't know how to access GP out of our services, for example. They don't know that if they call 111, with a concern that they can get an appointment booked into the GP to speak to them. They don't know that we have e-consult services where they can fill out complaints and come and access our services. All they know is that they have to call first thing in the morning, get an appointment. If they don't get an appointment, then they don't get an appointment. 
So that is how fundamentally flawed the system is when, in terms of um, the poor access that the communities have to healthcare in this country. And, and then if you look at vaccine, again, you know, there are communities that and um, people who are able to inquire about this and proactively inquire about getting home back home visits for vaccines and things like that, where the carers are inquiring on their behalf and you know families are on their behalf and getting these vaccines booked in. But without knowing that these are all possible things that can be done and can be accessed, the BME community is not doing it proactively. And they, you know they don't know that they can do it proactively. We say, are they to blame? Or, sh or should we be doing more? I, I think we should be doing more to give, encourage this access. And I think so equally, yes, the, uh, access is a big problem. And I think uh, we're not doing enough to get this message out to the community. We're, like Oni said, you know, the, the campaigns we used to do flu, for flu was you know, mass scale nationwide campaigns. Where are those campaigns for the COVID vaccine? Where are those campaigns in other languages? Why is it just you know, the little stuff that is out there? Why is it all in English? Where's the other? subjected targeted market uh, um, communication to these BME groups. So, and so what would you like to see? I would like to see that, you know, news flashes on Asian channels or radios and news flashes and information that's available in all different languages and information on the front door, information going out via post to people's houses. You know, when Brexit happened, the government decided to spend some thousands of pounds sending out leaflets. Why couldn't we see that for the COVID vaccine? Why couldn't we send something out to every person's house? Um, yeah. Would it really cost that much? And what, Seema, what do you think? What, what should, what would you like to see happen now in terms of um, communication? You know, whether from the government or civil society, what would you like to see happen? Um, it's a really good question because what, what has what is out there isn't isn't targeting everyone as we've as we've said yes in different languages but i know public health england are doing a lot of work on that um but again i mean who's going to look at public health england who's going to sit at home and and google public health england you know people we're talking about wouldn't do that i mean you know my mum wouldn't do that i think it's 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 more nuanced than that to be honest um I think the social media companies have a responsibility. In fact, the investigation we did recently, Facebook and um, WhatsApp took down the video of this man in India who is telling people that inhaling steam um, is, is preventing COVID. They took it down and then they sent us an email saying they'd taken it down. But you can't raise a fake video with Facebook and WhatsApp every time you see one. Um, yeah. I think the challenge is keeping up with the videos because the videos are popping up on a daily basis. So they've got to debunk the message. They've got to take it down. I mean, that really is quite some work. Um, and like I said, there's just nobody to notify them about every single video so they can take it down. So you'd like to see more action also from social media companies in dealing with vaccine information, especially on closed networks like WhatsApp. I think they have a responsibility to, yeah, I think, um, yeah, because like we've said, you know, they're popping up, they're spreading like wildfire. I mean, one WhatsApp group, uh, my mum's on has 200 people, messages are going back and forth. She then forwards that on to somebody else. And before we know it, you know, a thousand people have seen the same message and, and then it's hitting all the various communities. And, you know, we found that the same message actually had gone from Hampshire all the way up to Bradford um with many major cities in between having seen the same message and like i said 12 people from our sample had actually believed that message um so yeah i i, I think you know that they have a big responsibility a big part to play here only what do you think what would you like to see happen now like what what if you were given like five things we've made you prime minister of the uk what, what are you going to do Okay, I think the first thing is to run a public health campaign. It is long overdue. We did, we are doing it for the flu. We did it when COVID came out. Why are we not doing it yet for the vaccine? Tell people, signpost them, tell them what you think about it. I don't know about removing the information from the media because I just look at it like the more you remove, the more people will put on. 
that's so my first thing will be a huge huge public health campaign number two identify what the issues are for the communities because we generalize we generalize big but don't forget we're not all the same we all have our unique issues we all have our unique cultural differences why not tailor that message to what suits that group so for blacks there are issues you need to address like i said the experiments the misinformation do that if it's the fact that you need to put this information in BBC Asia Network, do that. Put the information in languages they understand where they can access it. That is very important. Number three, we have a lot of people that have faith. There are different faiths in England. We have the Muslims, we have the Christians, we have the Sikhs, we have so many of them. We trust our faith leaders. I trust my pastor because he is a religious leader over my over me and i trust what he says so use them involve them empower them let them empower other people it's really important and then my fourth one will be make the vaccine accessible get as many people vaccinated i understand the jcvi and the fact that we have to make the best use of what we have but let's ramp it up Put it down in some GP surgeries, get it going, get it to as many people as possible. And before you know what's happening, we've covered that 70% that we need for herd immunity. And then the last thing is we need to start addressing how we got here. COVID is going to someday get better. But then what happens after that? Are we going to wait for another pandemic to start having this conversation again? We shouldn't. We should start looking at what lessons do we have to learn and put things in place to say this does not happen again so that in the future we don't have a situation where a huge population do not trust us so get those things put in place now equalize care make sure that everyone is treated respectfully and with dignity and with cultural competence that way in the future they trust us and when we come and say this is good for you then they would listen so if I've ever made prime minister, those are my five points. <laughs> I think it has to be done now. With, with those five points, I think uh, you, you've uh, won the vote. Um, but OK, let me put both of the GPs on the spot here a little bit. If there are big issues with the way the NHS is dealt with, I'm not saying the NHS has done the job badly, certainly not in terms of vaccine ro ro uh, rollout. But in terms of the historical racism that people have faced, and as a result of that, they've become hesitant to trust doctors. What would you like to see uh, the NHS do differently going forward now? Tuva, do, do, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think one of the more, uh, one of the reasons that we're not engaging with the AME community more often or as well as we would like is that in, in some of the consultations we do with the AME community, there is that language barrier, culture barrier, belief barrier, and that takes more time from a GP. In a 10 minute consultation, it's almost impossible to let alone have a translator translate the consultation, let alone address, um, address those cultural and uh, you know, misinformation things. So we need more time for these communities to have access to healthcare that is proper and right, because they need that time for them to, for us to be able to break through that barrier and get through to them to provide those increased and improved outcomes for them compared to those of not the AME ethnic minorities who you know understand British language understand the way the system works understands the culture and have easy access to these things there are multiple barriers that we need to tackle when we're talking to these communities therefore we need better investment in addressing these communities needs in terms of their health care whether that's in health or otherwise in communication and targeting them in terms of healthcare campaigns. I guess the other thing is, you know, preventative medicine is not something the NHS has done for years. We've just ignored it, let it be, and we've been so busy tackling the chronic overload of chronic management and um, addressing um, healthcare planning overall in general. And that's why when the pandemic hit, even when it started off in China and it was moving to Italy, you know, how long did we take to react? Why? Why did we take so long to react? Did we not know, you know, 
We know how pandemics work. We know how things spread. Why were we not projecting how long it would take to get us get to us? Why were we not projecting how much supplies we need in PPE? Why were we not projecting how we're going to develop a vaccine? Why are we not investing at that point? Why did we wait till it got home before we were in a, you know start talking? Yeah, because that's because that's the attitude the NHS have had for many years. We've just neglected preventative medicine. It's not a concept we understand. Apart from cardiovascular health, you know, in medical school even, there's not much focus. Anything but cardiovascular health is ignored. Yeah, heart attacks, you know, the things that are fatal are the only things we focus on in terms of preventative medicine. Hygiene, general preventative medicine, exercise, you know, health is neglected. Yes, we highlight it now and then in curriculum from here and there, but there is never any proper attention paid to it. So I think that's the things we need to address. We need to address the fundamental way we deliver healthcare to patients overall, and in particular, this healthcare community, uh, in BAME community that need that extra investment for us to get through to them. And the, and the same question to you, Oni, what, um, what do you think the NHS should do differently going, going forward? I think I would agree with at least one of the things that Tuva said absolutely, absolutely, we need investment because I'm a GP in inner city Birmingham and the same rules, the same contract applies to us as it applies to anywhere else in Birmingham, say in Solihull or Monks Park, which are leafier areas. It can't be because these areas need more investment and that is part of where we got, why we are where we are. Because if you're saying to me, like Duva said, see them in the same amount of time. It's not the same, but I don't have a choice because that is the contract that I've been given. And does it then make you wonder when I try to recruit people to those areas, like we've tried to recruit a few times doctors and they wouldn't come because it is high impact and the patients need more care but then we don't have the resources to provide as much care as we would like to. And that keeps widening the health inequality gap. So we need to start thinking about how we can resource these areas so that we can meet the needs of the people. Because then when we do that, we're not in the position where we are today. Thank you. And uh, Seema's final question to you as well. Do you have a a message to other people in the media in terms of what what they should be doing differently. It, it, <laughs> should, <laughs> I know. Should journalists <laughs> what should journalists be saying right now or asking? I think in terms of this pandemic, when it comes. Well, to I think we need to keep covering this story because the more we cover it, the more awareness there is that this is a problem and it's a big problem because not only as we know state the obvious, but it's affecting those who don't take the vaccine, but also those around them. So. I think from my point of view, I just want to keep kind of digging deeper and, and, and kind of, you know, see whether this continues, whether, um, you know, these media broadcasts, whether these messages from community leaders and faith leaders who are working so hard, whether they're actually getting through to these communities. Um, but yeah, I would just say keep covering this story, really. Excellent. I'm sorry we don't have more time. Really, really want to thank all the panelists. We had some really great questions as well as really great answers. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have a weekly debate uh, at Open Democracy. You can have a look at Open Democracy's website, opendemocracy.net. Um, and we also post these discussions on YouTube where you can watch this discussion afterwards. Uh, I want to thank the panel for joining us, Tuva, Oni, Seema. And um, also I wanted to say briefly that Open Democracy relies on contributions and donations. So if you want to see more public interest debates and journalism like this, please support us. Thank you again. I'm Sunny Handel. Thank you and hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sunny.